Uh, let's call on Chris Finley. He's our senior vice president and mortgage banking manager. Chris, would you like to say a few words? <laughs> Thank you all for having us today. It's an honor for us to sponsor uh, the chamber. It's an honor for us to have Shannon uh, to be the chamber president this year. Um, she's a shining star in our organization. And, uh, uh, so we're proud to have, have her represent us uh, in the chamber. Um, this is our uh, third year um, in Ohio County. Um, and we've, uh, I, I've been so impressed with the community. Um, there's so many things that this community offers and that you all should be proud of. Um, uh, tons of good people that I've met. Um, a very active business community. It's a solid school system. Um, I didn't know a lot about Ohio, Ohio County before uh, we came into this market. Um, and like I said, I've been thoroughly impressed and our bank has been impressed with um, how active the community is. Um, Active communities and successful communities um, come from great people. Um, we employ some of those people in our organization. Of course, Shannon, um, Tammy Smith, Travis Hub is here um, with us as well. Jane Hunley, and then Scott Lewis is on our advisory board. So, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a wonderful uh, uh, three years uh, that we've spent in this market. And, um, we've got to meet many of you as customers and been involved in the community with you. So uh, we thank you for your support. <coughs> okay, you welcome us in the community and continue to support us. Thank you. Now I'd like to re recognize um, some of the leaders here. Judge Executive David Johnson. David, would you like to say anything? I'm just glad to be here. Okay. And we've got Justin Count, our county attorney. Yes, same thing. Um, is there any new members here for Chamber this month? We didn't see any come in, but I don't want to miss anybody recognizing them. So, okay. And now I'm going to recognize the um, this month's business in the spotlight. It's Carter Harrell State Farm. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it over to Brian Belcher, our Vice President, to introduce our speaker. Welcome, hope everyone enjoyed their meal. I know I certainly did, probably had a little too much, but uh, certainly happy to be here and to uh, welcome uh, our guest speaker here in just a moment. Um, the United Way of the Ohio Valley is also uh, in attendance today, and there is uh, representatives, or there are representatives that are here, and also Rachel uh, Deaver, which is currently right over the organization here, uh, wanted me to pass along that she regrets she's not able to be here today, but she wanted to provide a little bit of an update on um, what the United Way of Ohio Valley is doing. Um, they just kicked off their campaign. They kicked it off at Walmart last week, and um, they have packed the pantry, is what they did there, and they've already, they, I think, got several hundred pounds of food. So it's been a great way to kick off, and uh, she wanted me to pass along that for additional information on what United Way of Ohio Valley is doing in this community, you can go to their website. It's uwov.org, and that is uh, where you can go and kind of see all of the uh, great things that United Way is doing with our businesses here locally. That said, I'd like to sure to welcome Representative Comer here with us. Uh, Congressman Comer proudly represents the 1st District of Kentucky in the United States House of Representatives. He serves constituents in 35 counties spanning from western Kentucky to the south central portion of the Commonwealth and held a town hall in every county in the district during his first year in office. He is a member of the House Committee on Agriculture, the Oversight and Government Reform, and Small Business Committees. Congressman Comer is an advocate for eliminating wasteful government spending, <laughs> implementing business-friendly regulatory reform, and creating opportunities for Kentucky's deserving farmers. In 2018, he became the first Kentucky representative to sit on the Farm Bill Conference Committee in <clears throat> nearly three decades. Prior to serving in Congress, Congressman Comer attended West Kentucky University, majoring in agriculture. He then served six terms in the Kentucky State House and was the Kentucky Commissioner of Agriculture. <laughs> Congressman Comer still operates the Comer Family Farm in his hometown of Tompkinsville, Kentucky, in Monroe County. He and his wife, TJ, they have three children, 
and they are certainly proud to call the first district of Kentucky home. So please welcome Representative Coleman. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be back in Ohio County. I know it seems like every time I'm in Ohio County, we're, we're at a function here in this building, but uh, I know you have a very active chamber here and I appreciate seeing everyone here and I appreciate everything that you do for this great community. Uh, I was asked to kind of give a Washington update and then open it up to see if anyone had any questions and I would certainly love to answer your questions. But and just to give you an update, and since this is a chamber of commerce, which is predominantly business and community oriented, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the things that we've tried to do in this Congress and this presidential administration to focus on business. Because I believe that when you look at, the, at society and the problems that we have in society, uh, whether those problems be poverty, whether they be drug addiction, whether they be a lack of, of opportunity, the, the solution to a lot of our problems can be found in having a good paying job. And if you want to create an environment where people have access to good paying jobs, you have to focus on the business climate. So the first thing that this Congress, and I, I started, I actually started right after my election in November of 2016 because my predecessor Ed Whitfield had resigned, but I'm still considered a freshman starting in January of 2017, and of course President, was, President Trump was inaugurated in January of 2017. The first year in office, we, we focused uh, right out of the gate on the regulations. Ohio County being a, a coal county, you know that there were a lot of regulations in the previous administration that were hostile to the coal industry. It wasn't just the coal industry, it was also financial services. I know we have community bankers here. There was a, a rule called Dodd-Frank that had a negative impact on community banking. There are people in here involved in healthcare. I don't need to tell anyone involved in healthcare the, the regulations that are unnecessary and viewed as burdensome that, that have made the healthcare industry an industry that's really struggling to survive right now. So we focused on reducing the regulatory burden. And we passed a piece of legislation called the Congressional Review Act in about March or April of 2017. What that did was it allowed the administration to go through and look at the regulations that have been passed over the last decade uh, in different industries and see if these regulations are, are good regulations or if these regulations are burdensome regulations that are holding the private sector back. Because the goal was to try to get the government off the backs of the private industry, to let the private sector grow and flourish, to create new opportunities, to be able to grow the economy, to be able to uh, create an environment where we have wage inflation, because wages have remained stagnant for so many years. And we have focused on different industries, whether it's the coal industry, whether it's financial services, whether it's healthcare, whether it's manufacturing, and looked at the regulations to try to see the ones that are working, the ones that are needed, let's let them keep them in place. If there's a regulation that's burdensome that doesn't make sense, then let's remove that regulation. So I think we've had success through the Congressional Review Act, which was passed in early 2017. Then you fast forward to around December, of 2017 we passed a major piece of legislation that affects every single person in this room and every single American that, that works and that's called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And what that did was significantly reduce taxes for every working American. And I know sometimes on, on uh, the national cable news networks and, and some of the national Newspapers, they say, well, it, it only benefited the rich or it only benefited big businesses. And I'm the first person to stand up and say that's not right. And I love to share the statistic. In our congressional district, the first congressional district of Kentucky with the 35 counties and the very gerrymandered U-shape of the first congressional district, we're one of the poorer congressional districts in America. One interesting statistic about this congressional district is 81% of the people in our district take the standard deduction when they file taxes. In other words, they do not itemize. I itemize my taxes. I own a business, a farming operation, so I fill out my taxes, I deduct different things, I itemize. And I would say most people in this room itemize your taxes. 81% of the people do not. They take the standard deduction. So they 
work somewhere, they get a W-2, they go to H&R Block, or, or they do it themselves and say, this is what my income was, I file my tax. <clears throat> the standard deduction prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was $12,000, meaning you didn't pay any taxes, any federal taxes, on the first $12,000 of income. With this legislation, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was signed into law in December 2017, we doubled the standard deduction to $24,000. Meaning the first $24,000 of your income is not subject to any federal taxes. Plus, we kept the child tax credit. We kept the adoption tax credit. We also kept the mortgage interest deduction. So if you're working, if you're the average worker in the 1st Congressional District of Kentucky, and you have a mortgage on your house and you have two kids, you're possibly not going to pay a penny of federal taxes this year. So that impacted 81% of the district right there. And if you own a business, whether it's a, an S corporation, a C corporation, an LLC, or a sole proprietorship, however your business is set up, then your tax rate was significantly lower with this Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The goal there, obviously, is to uh, give you more of your money that you make, and how could you reinvest that into the economy? Because I believe, and the President believes, that uh, the best way to generate economic growth is through private individuals and not through government spending. So that's something that we focused on in 2017 to look at how do we improve the business climate, grow the economy, uh, create an environment where existing businesses want to reinvest their savings and, and hopefully expand, and to where private individuals have more money to invest in the economy. So you fast forward to this year, the next part that the president really focused on that's been hard for hard for a lot of us in Congress, me, especially being an ag guy, and I was talking uh, at my table with two good farmers about it, and that's the uh, the, the tariff situation. So if you look at the overall economy and, and businesses, and I've toured businesses in Ohio County and all 35 counties, uh, very dependent on the export market. All your farmers, and you just look out the window and see corn and soybeans and tobacco all around. The majority of the soybeans and tobacco is exported. The majority of the corn probably goes for chicken feed, which most of the poultry is exported now. So we have a significant dependence on export markets. But if you look at manufacturing, we have a lot of manufacturers that export some, but we have a lot of manufacturers that have gone out of business over the last 20 years because of unfair trade practices. And that's had a negative impact on American workers. And if, if it were a level playing field and you had a country like China that, that's just, they're just, more efficient than we are, then that would be our fault. But what's happened is with China, they have not abided by our trade agreements. China has been doing things like stealing our patents, disregarding our patents, taking our intellectual property. They don't abide by the same environmental laws. They don't have child labor laws like we do. And they've created an environment where they manipulate their currency through their Federal Reserve which they can say, well, if the dollar needs to be a strong dollar to where they have a competitive advantage, they make their currency weaker. If it needs to be a weak dollar, they make their currency stronger. Whatever's in their best interest at the time to be able to enhance their exports to create United States having to import because it's cheaper to import from China than produce in America. And the last three presidents in both parties have said, well, we're going to do something about this. China's cheap, and we're going to do something, but they never did. And this president has, and he's drawn a line in the sand, which is where we are today. We've rolled back the regulations, we've cut taxes, but we've got a situation where nobody wants to be in a trade war with China or Mexico or Canada. But if we don't enforce the trade laws. If we don't have trade laws that at least put American workers on a level playing field, then in the future there's not going to be a lot the United States can do from a policy standpoint or from a tax standpoint if we're going to continue to lose manufacturing jobs to, to foreign countries. 
So I think that we're in a situation where we we can't continue to kick the can down the road with respect to trade policy, and we're trying to renegotiate our trade agreements with Mexico, with Canada, and with China. I'm happy to say today there's a significant amount of progress that's taken place with Mexico. I believe we're very close to announcing a bilateral trade agreement with Mexico that will be good for agriculture, it will be good for manufacturing, it will be good for everyone, because we have a good trading relationship with Mexico already. And you look at Canada, and I believe that that's going to come along because they really don't have anywhere to go. Uh, Canada, ironically, is, is Kentucky's largest export market for everything whether it's agriculture, automotive parts, aerospace, Canada is our largest export market. So it's in our best interest that we get a, a trade agreement with Canada. I believe those are coming along very good. Then you get China. And it's still, the, the, this is not going to be an easy road to get a trade agreement with China. And I think that uh, we're probably going to be in this for several more months. But hopefully at the end of the day, the United States has good negotiators at the table and we'll be able to emerge from that with a good fair trade agreement. If that's the case, and if that happens, I think you're going to see a renaissance in manufacturing in America. And I believe that the part of America that will benefit most from a renaissance in manufacturing will be rural America. I think it'll be places like Hartford and Beaver Dam, and places like Tompkinsville, where I live, because these are the places that have not fared the best uh, with the trade agreements in the past. Most of the new economy companies that came in and, and adapted to NAFTA and, and uh, the, the trade agreements with and, and the export market for China, these companies kind of ended up in the urban and suburban areas. And they and they were really focused on infrastructure and where the closest ports were, where the closest airports were, where the most best rail spurs were. It left out a lot of rural America. So, I believe that uh, we've got some short-term pain to hopefully provide long-term gain with respect to trade. And I wanted to mention that today because this is a business organization. It's something that's affecting every single business in, in Ohio County and every single business in Kentucky and America for that matter. Uh, but I do believe progress is being made, especially with Mexico and Canada, and hopefully the President will be able to deliver some good news very, very soon. Uh, with that, if anybody has any questions, I will attempt to answer them. If not, I will sit back down and I enjoy lunch as I always do in Ohio County. And I want to recognize Sandy Simpson, who's our district director. Uh, she's covering Ohio County now. So. Sandy's in charge of complaints. If anybody has any complaints, if, if you see Sandy, if Sandy's not here, then T.C. Sanderford is in charge of complaints. <laughs> He's their backup person. <laughs> yes, sir. Just got a quick question. Um, the increase in standard deduction has mm -hmm. been a lot of good. Uh, but some of the groups that are being negatively affected by that are nonprofits, mm -hmm. churches, and things. Because some of the incentives that they used to count on are no longer there. Mm -hmm. Would you be open to discussing any above the line incentives for, uh, I've had to work for a nonprofit, but um, for certain circumstances, um, because some of the estimates say that the nonprofit communities may lose a hundred million dollars yeah. this year because of that. So is there any talk in Washington mm -hmm. about how do we adjust for that? There is, and that's what, and I appreciate the question, that's a very good question. That, Tax Cuts 2.0, as Trump says. What that revolves is mainly two things. To make adjustments for unintended consequences to charitable organizations, number one. And number two, make the individual tax cuts permanent. Because in the bill, I, I knew parliamentary procedure before I went to Washington. If you were ever at FFA, you know FFA, that's where you learn parliamentary. I was state FFA president, so I was on the parliamentary procedure teams and all that. And I was in the state house for 11 years, and they go pretty much by Robert's Rules of Order. Congress is always changing the rules, and they change the rules so much that I, nobody knows the rules, you know. They, but uh, they had a rule to be able to pass the tax cuts bill. It, they had to change the rules in the Senate from 
60 votes to 50 votes because it normally takes 60 votes to pass a bill in the Senate, which is a problem when you've got 51 Republicans and 49 Democrats and they vote party line on everything. It's very difficult to get to 60 in that environment. So we had to change the rule, and for some reason, the individual tax cuts couldn't be permanent. It wasn't anything to gouge individuals. The corporate tax cuts were permanent, the individual tax cuts weren't. And that was a PR uh, issue for, for, uh, for some of the sponsors of the bill. But anyway, the, the, the 2.0 is going to, because we want charitable giving. So me, and I think most of the people in the House here, in my opinion, the, the government in the future is going to have to tighten its belt. The government cannot continue to operate in deficit spending. So there's always going to be a need for help with poverty. There's always going to be a need for help for, for people with disabilities. The government is not going to be able to continue, in my opinion, to fund those at the same level. So we're going to have to ask the private sector. We're going to have to be more charitable organizations. The, the churches are going to have to play a bigger role in benevolence and things like that. So we've got to create an environment where we have more charitable giving and not less. So that's something that, that I recognize and a lot of people have recognized. And, uh, no one thought that that would impact charitable giving or anything like that. But we're going, when we pass the first, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So the Tax Cuts 2.0 is going to clean up everything. And you've had, uh, what is this, September? So you've had 10 months to kind of see <coughs> how the original tax cut bill, the things that are working, if there are unintended consequences, and that's going to be at the top of the list. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> Anything else? <coughs> Appreciate the uh, superintendent and all the elected officials that are here today. And look, I enjoy working with uh, the people in Ohio County. With that, I will turn it back over and thank you very much for the invitation to be here and we'll stick around a little while after it's over with. Uh, again, the, uh, if you have anything you want to talk to me about, I'll be happy to talk to you, listen to you. Uh, complaint, Sandy Simpson, and when Sandy leaves, TC will be around. So, all right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Palmer, for coming out and speaking to us today. Uh, right now we're going to move on to announcements. We're going to do our third quarter Chamber Excellence Award. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, um, this award is presented to a member of the Ohio County Chamber of Commerce, either an individual or business that demonstrates a continuing active interest in the well-being of the Chamber and has made a significant contribution to the overall success of the Chamber. Uh, it will be Purdue. And just to tell you a little bit about Purdue, um, they're the county's largest employer, also supports the livelihood of many family farmers, undergoing a large expansion adding 150 new jobs. They recently built uh, 40 new poultry houses and continuously they are adding more. They support the chamber events and any other community organizations. They recently launched Poultry Education Center and Viewing Room. It's the first of its kind in the nation, in conjunction with Hayden Farms in northern Ohio County. Brittany Fowers is going to be our speaker on that, so I probably just stole some of your ideas. I'm sorry. So. <laughs> So on behalf of Purdue, we just want to thank the Chamber and the community for this award. Uh, like she said, we recently went on a hiring blitz within seven surrounding counties, including Ohio County. We've added um, 150 jobs for the first time in, since we've been here. It will be 22 years in February. Our plant is almost completely staffed. 
and that wouldn't be possible without the great folks of Ohio County. Uh, we were recruited here. Uh, we've partnered with the Career Center here. Uh, we have went to lunch at the Z and advertised there. So uh, we're just trying to get out and be known again. And we just appreciate this award and thank you guys. Remember, um, the Ohio County Fair is taking place September 20th and the tw through the 22nd. It's at the fairgrounds. Um, we will be sponsoring Small Business Saturday. And we will also, the Chamber will be having a Christmas parade. So anybody that would like to be in the parade, Andy Fleener, uh, <laughs> we would like to have you. Okay, now we're going to draw for... Uh, business in the spotlight. Be around building supply. <laughs> Judy will have the gift back there. Okay. Now I'm going to do the ticket. So everybody get your ticket out. 608725. She'll have that. Okay. And remember in the back we have the Scholar for Dollar Scholarship Fund. You can drop your loose change in there It's when you go out. And I also have an invitation for everyone. Um, the Western Kentucky Botanical Gardens. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? What's, what's going on on that? Uh, back this fall, Western Kentucky Botanical Gardens are going to be in the big independent warehouse which is like 56 where Golf Man is, Lamb Brothers, uh, Moonlight Barbecue, you can wear your cowboy boots, your cowboy hat, casual clothes, but come in, it's a great event. And we have some flyers here if you like to take us, okay? Thank you. Next month's meeting will be on October 16th. Hope everybody will be here. Thank you.